<laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the last speaker, I guess either it's good you can run late or everyone will run and then you should stop, right? Uh, so so um, I, I've really enjoyed uh, the last two days. I want to thank the, uh, the organizers. I mean, it seems a really wonderful conference. Uh, I guess I'm up here to talk about something a little different, and that's why it was to be announced. And um, it's really, uh, I, I hope you stay, but it's, it's kind of a failure if you look at, the, I think, the monitor. I tried to do two things, and we, you know, uh, one sort of worked, I'll talk about it in a second, and one hasn't worked, but we learned some things. So I think workshops are maybe a good place to do that. I hope you agree. Uh, and, you know, I'll proceed. I mean, it's, go it's certainly going to touch on counting and coloring and things like that. I, I, I do, um, the reason I put the color thing up, I don't know. I, I like to start with a joke. I can't think of a really good one today, so I guess I'll skip that. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's a joke. I don't know. Uh, well, it's a good one. I, I, I think that my, one of my best ones was I, I once did the first slide upside down. Um, after I'd been just a year at Georgia Tech, and my dean didn't know it was obviously a joke, and we had the projector, and I had the AV people come up. We were trying to turn the connector, <laughs> and I think he was sort of sweating. I hired this moron, you know, <laughs> and we finally got it to work. Anyway, okay. So, so what, what, what are we talking about? So, uh, it was supposed to, well, uh, I think the... Uh, some of the uh, animation may be off. I'll, it doesn't matter. So, uh, you know, 4CT is, just stands for four color theorem. I think it was mentioned, was it yesterday, that we're computer scientists mostly, so we believe it. And those of us uh, who are mathematicians, we know five colors for sure, because <laughs> we all know how the, how the proof goes. Um, I think I sort of believe it, especially, um, you know, there are now two computer proofs. But what we really always want to know is a proof that somehow it's not just humanly checkable, because I think there's a lot of discussion about what is a good proof. And I know in this area, um, some of the proofs are quite long. Uh, some people have 96-page proofs, for example. <laughs> and uh, obviously, checking is really, really critical. So one, one of the things, you know, it was sort of killed any surprise here, but in any event, you all know the standard definition. You know, take a planar graph and you try to four color it. The uh, vertices or the countries, depending how you like to look at it. It's been raised since the 1800s. It was proved, I guess, in the 70s by Appellant and Hawken, um, original computer proof. And, and now, you know, there's a much shorter one. Computers are much faster. I remember going to the talk that uh, Hawken gave at Yale at the time. I was, I guess, you know, just beginning my career there. And he got asked one interesting question. What kind of computer did you use? Because then we didn't really have laptops. And he said it was blue. That was his, <laughs> which if you know, and you're old enough, that meant it was an IBM mainframe. Uh, anyway, so a, a couple of us, I want to talk about, for color, maybe a human proof approach. And here's sort of our thought. And I'll just give a quick kind of, kind of summary of this idea. It's not, it's not, very deep, uh, but it does apply to some other open problems. And I you know, gave the way the punchline already. Anyway, Tate noticed in 1880, uh, and I guess we all agree that was a while ago, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, 1880, he noticed that it's exactly equivalent to um, taking every bi connected cubic graph and asking if it has an edge three coloring. So those are the same. And it's a very neat proof, if you haven't ever looked at it. Actually, one direction is really easy, and the other one's a little harder. Um, this is the way it works. Uh, what bridge lists mean? Uh, two connected. So it has no edge that when you remove it, it disconnects the graph. Right? You, you, you understand what I'm, I'm saying? OK. I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah, I should have probably said, two. anyway, bridgeless is, is his terminology. Uh, but it had to be a perfect coloring. I mean, a usual coloring of the kind you all talk about. You put 
you know, every edge gets red, green, or blue, and you don't get any bad edges like this, you know, two reds colliding. So what we looked at, and we said, well, look, uh, you know, what, what might we do if we were combinatorialists or, you know, you know, computer scientists? Well, how about finding a three-edge coloring that doesn't make a lot of errors? Sounds like a pretty natural question. I mean, we know, because the four-color theorem is true, and this is equivalence, and there's actually a linear, I think, I think you can go linear time from one to the other. Uh, so you actually can get a fast coloring. And that's an interesting point. The actual proof by Appel and Hock, and then later by uh, Seymour and company, not only, both of those proofs, not only prove there is a coloring, they find it. And the original proof, I was thinking it was n cubed time. All well, the constants are not tiny, but they're not astronomical. And later it went to quadratic time. So they actually proved too much, right? I mean, whenever you're working on an open problem, one piece of advice is don't prove too much. Um, no one asked, because in the 1880s, I guess no one thought about algorithms, but you don't have to have an algorithm to solve this problem. And if we had a human readable proof that just proved the existence of a coloring, I think that'd be pretty spiffy. I mean, you know, you, you, you can imagine. So anyway, we looked at this and we said, well, maybe there would be applications where if you just made a, this is supposed to be a little O, you just made a small number of errors, you know, maybe N over log N or N over Ackerman inverse or, you know, something uh, very close to linear. You almost missed it, you know. You almost got them all wrong, okay? But it's little O. And what we could show is these are all equivalent. Remember, these are classic. So we could prove that if you are uh, able to color an arbitrary uh, cubic, you know, I'll say that it sounds like your, your magic word, but a Tate graph, that will mean something that's bridgeless, cubic, planar. Uh, if, you, if you could edge color it appropriately uh, and not make a lot of errors, then you're done. You prove it before color theorem. So we thought that was kind of a neat, neat idea. We, we sent it at least to once to a conference. I was telling one person over a break uh, earlier, we got rejected probably correctly because maybe it was a little bit wrong conference, but I love that one of the rejection reasons for one of the referees was why did we, how could we assume that every cubic graph of this type had an even number of vertices? Now, I hope that's a joke for you, right? Does everybody know <laughs> that cubic graphs tend, like all of them, to have <laughs> an even number? <laughs> okay, so move on. So, so how did we do this? So here's our paper. It's 2013. It's, I, I left off the, uh, it's a, like a journal of graphs here. Um, this is some of the other um, people that worked on it. They were all, at the time, grad students. I kept, they left, and I kept kind of arguing we should send it somewhere, so we finally did. Uh, so it's a little bit of older result. So, so let, let me just explain. It, it's a really simple idea, but what I like about it, first of all, I think maybe there's a way to do that. You know, that would be really cool. We couldn't do it. We tried a little bit. But you could imagine some technology that, you know, we haven't thought about to just, you know, some clever algorithm that makes mistakes. You know, you make this into an SDP, a semi-definite program, and you prove some really cool theorem that it doesn't make too many errors. I don't know. Does that at least seem interesting? I hope. Yes? I'll skip a whole bunch of slides. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the way we, I mean, here's how you would obviously attack it, I'm sure. So you, you have some planar graph. You assume it's a counterexample. It might be a very big graph. It might be small. It doesn't really matter. But you can't, it's, it's a Tate graph, you can't edge color it appropriately. But it only has one error, right? Um, so we want to show that you can make a lot more errors. So you, think, you should immediately think uh, amplification. Um, and that's, what, that's why we were interested in it, I think. So what we decided to do is to try to build an amplifier. So take the same graph that can't be colored and you try to use this to build a bigger graph that was a Tate counterexample. Now, you might say, oh, I'm already done, but of course these aren't connected. So I've got to somehow glue in edges. And it's, you know, here's the high level of the amplifier. 
you, you have the original graph with many errors. Of course, this goes on for a long time. You add an edge and you add little gadgets that I'm not going to explain the super details. But what you have to show is the following. Let's suppose uh, you had an algorithm that only made uh, three errors. Right? <coughs> then what would happen is one of these structures would actually be three, I'm sorry, yeah, three color, edge colored correctly. The trouble is you've got to, you've got to color this, not with this junk hanging off it. In other words, the junk that's hanging off is sort of uh, extra stuff. It might actually make that graph easier to color. So the argument, which is not hard and certainly does not take a lot of pages, uh, what was the comment in one of the early talks? Everything that's easy is almost trivial. Is that was near, near trivial? That seemed almost like a tautology, and I won't say this is trivial. But it, it's not hard. One of the things that's neat about it is it really has to use planarity in, in a, a serious way. So what you have to do is you take this graph you've damaged, you use some duality tricks and remove things, and then you do use duality again, and eventually get that the original graph is colorable. So, you know, it's just an amplifier trick. And we've seen this what, all over computer science. So here's a graph coloring example that, that we did. What, what I liked about it, let me move on to my next. You can also do funky other things. So, you know, you could say, well, I could arrange these so the diameter of this graph instead of being linear, it stays um, small. So you could start to make conjectures, which we've thought about. Uh, could you prove something like, uh, if I have a planar graph, maybe exponential in the diameter or, or not too exponential in the diameter, I could, I could color the edges and not make too many errors. You know, maybe you make the number of errors as a f function of the diameter. You could, you could arrange these graphs in other ways, in grids and other things. No, I, I don't know. Um, I, you know. If we could solve it, we would, would, that's what I would be talking about, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, I'm going to switch to something else in a second. I, I'm just repeating it and by connected the same as uh, Tate graph here. Uh, I don't know if there's a real chance, you know, there's our miracle. We can prove that you take one of these Tate graphs that you can color it uh, appropriately and not make a lot of errors. We just don't know how to do that. I wish I knew uh, an idea for that. Um, you know, if somebody gets a good one, uh, cool. The, the one thing that's nice about this, well, I'll, t I'll tell you, sort of uh, truth in, le in lending. I went to, and we have very strong gr uh, graph theorists, so Robin Thomas, I think when we first figured this out, I went to tell him, I mean, how do you say I'm completely uninterested and your result in a polite way, because he's a very polite person. Uh, I mean, one, he, he was, you know, co-author of one of the, the second proofs, so he knows it's true, even though it's a computer truth. Second, this is not the way he thinks, right? I mean, if you know the Seymour, Minor, you know, that part of the world, which I know intersects very much with a lot of what people do here, they like very precise theorems that are about structure of graphs, and it's, it's more... I don't know, it's, it's just a different kind of thing. But I did get him perked up a little bit, because we realized, I think it's not in the current paper, but we realized that the same technology does work for some open problems in uh, graph flow problems. So you could talk to me offline. But there are a whole bunch of questions about taking graphs and building nowhere zero flows and other kinds of flows on graphs, just existence questions that kind of generalize the four-color theorem in certain ways, and they're open. But the same tricks actually work, so you can build an amplifier. So again, for those flow problems, you could say, oh, could I uh, show I could at least not violate the constraints too often? So, all right. So I'd like to switch to a different part. I guess if there's any questions, you can interrupt any time. And is this OK? All right. I'll even use a different background since you know it's something. So uh, how to prove, yeah. I was supposed to say how not to, but yes, sure. OK. I mean, I guess if I, I don't believe this, but I, 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 I really think P could equal NP, but not sharp P. But obviously, if P equals sharp P, there's some issues here <laughs> at, at this meeting especially, right? Anyway. Uh, so I'd like to, like to say uh, thank you, Uris. So this is uh, 
uh, I'm pretty sure it's 75, I just really got into Yale, and he gave the following talk. I think it was uh, essentially the key thing he said, and these are supposed to be subsets. I just couldn't find a symbol in the, uh, in the time I had. Anyway, uh, he pointed out, look, you've got log spaces you know, contained in P and NP and uh, sharp P and P space. And he said, look, we know, you know, this is classic, everyone knows by a diagonalization. I mean, these are way off, right? Log versus poly is not even close. Um, so that means, of course, uh, oh, it does work here. Of course, one of these uh, containments is strict. Probably they're all, many people would believe that, but, right, at least one is strict. Which one? Well, I guess that would be really nice to know. Uh, you know, like, uh, again, with this group, it would be very bad if things collapsed down to here. <laughs> I don't have any secret punchline coming up. <laughs> Get you worried. Uh, you know, but I, I, you know, anyway. So, so a long time ago, I, I said, well, let's try, you know, in my spare time. <laughs> let's think about it. But the, the obvious one I thought, oh, oh boy, too, too sensitive. The obvious one I thought was, um, to look at the biggest gap. So the biggest gap, at least for me, uh, we could add there are new classes, of course, known. But the biggest gap that, that seemed plausible that you might be able to make some progress on uh, was log space against you know, counting. And that just, you, know, you can't go too much further because you hit P space. It's a theorem, and you don't want to go too below log space. I mean, you, you know, maybe it's not so interesting. So we, you know, I mean, this is some stuff I've worked on, and we didn't get anywhere, or I didn't get anywhere rather. Uh, but I, I discovered some interesting things, I think. Uh, okay. So let, let me, let me. I won't claim this is hard to say as D rectangularization problem. I will not say it 149 more times. So, okay. <laughs> Just show I was listening. Okay. Uh, so let me, there's something, I'll, I'll just call it a two-line problem. So the deal is, you've got a directed graph. It, it, these are the only edges. These are supposed to be directed edges. And you have starts and finishes, starts and finishes. Uh, notice this is a different order. So all you have is two, two long lines, but you should think of these lines as really, really long. Okay? I mean, gigantic. And your job is to figure out, does S1 go to terminal 1 or terminal 2? Fair enough? I mean, seems like an interesting question. Uh, what it has to do with separating log space, you'll see. So just to be a little more concrete, although we can play lots of games here. But imagine further that the graph that you have, either this graph or this graph, you have a small description of it a small circuit. And it's even going to be a very special kind of circuit, a really simple kind of circuit. Um, but I'll get to that in a little bit. So that means, what do I mean? I mean, if you pick any vertex, it will tell you whether it's on one of the lines, its predecessor, its successor. I'll tell you the starts and the finishes. They're all n-bit you know, um, bit strings. Uh, so I've described it to you. And your job is to figure out this, you know, who goes where. And I would call it the brute force algorithm would be just start here and keep taking successors until you hit something. All right? Seems good. So the question is, can you do better than brute force? And the answer is yes. And unfortunately, uh, I'll tell you how to do this, at least at some high level. It's not that complicated, uh, can, well, compared to what you give. It's simple. But it has a few ideas that I like, so I'd like to share them with you. I think you might enjoy, and you may not know them. Um, but it turns out you can do this. And what I mean by solve, uh, I'll, I'll be a little more precise in a second, but I think I'd rather explain the, ha the, the, the how, and you'll see why it's efficient. All right? Is that everybody fair with me? So what you do is you take the lines, and you connect them all possible ways. So what I mean is you... You can certainly put an artificial edge here and an artificial edge here, and that would get one cycle. Or you could put the edge from here to here and the edge from here to here. You, no, no, so you don't know which way you're doing it, right? So you, you might agree that I'll take the string labeled T1 and map it to TS1 and the string T2 to S2. So what am I going to get? Well, 
I'm going to get two cycles or one. So in the case where I guess correctly, I'm going to get S1 and, and T1 correctly, I'm going to get one huge directed cycle. And I'm going to get another one that'll actually, in our case, you can even assume they have the same size. You know, that's, I don't think that matters, but it's, it's an interesting point. And in this case, oops, in this case, uh, it's of course twice the size. So uh, you need to tell this apart. I mean, that doesn't look like a lot of progress, I don't think, unless you've thought about it a little bit. Um, because, you know, you're sort of still in the brute force position, right? Where if you start somewhere and start walking, you know, I mean, it's a long way around uh, for both of these. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we really can, oh, I'll take it turns. I don't like jumping back, but I will. Um, these are really permutations, right? Every, remember, every vertex is a, di is a distinct string, so you can think of it as I'm mapping to this one, I'm mapping to this one. So this is a permutation on two cycles. Remember, every permutation has unique, you know, break up into cycles. So you've got a, either a permutation with two cycles or one. Ah, so now, if I have a permutation, is there some cheap way to tell the number of cycles I have without walking around? And the answer is sort of, or at least not, not too difficult. So here, here's the key that I'm going to show you a little more detail. But it's basically the, the, the parity, meaning the number of permutation cycles, rather. The number of cycles your permutation has mod 2 is determined uh, by a relatively simple formula that you can check fast or rapidly. And of course, we know two and three are different. I'm going to point that out in a second, right? I mean, but here it's even worse. Two is different than four. You know, it's just it's just some bad things. But let's just concentrate on two. So if we can compute the parity of the number of cycles, then obviously we're done, right? Because it's even even or odd. Okay. Parity was the number of two cycles. Like you break it up into a bunch of two cycles. Am I wrong about that? No, you just, every permutation. Is, is a collection of cycles, right? Right. So, uh, oh, you're, you're talking about trans, transpositions. Yeah, that's something else. That's right. That's right. No, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, actually, not. not, not right. So it just, you know, if we just have everybody point to somebody in this group and everyone over there, we'd have two cycles. For example. All right. Um, we just take our names and use it for. Uh, you, you understand. So. Where am I? Okay. So we have a draft of some thing. I, I guess I felt I was going to leave this out, but I felt I need some mathematical formula. Otherwise, uh, maybe I don't belong here and, and something I would, some, some envy of all these talks with lots and lots of symbols. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I guess joke. Okay. Uh, so this is from a draft of a paper I could share with someone if they're interested. Um, which is actually relatively long, not because it's hard, it just has a lot of details about things. Anyway, suppose that pi is a permutation, you know, over the usual uh, thing with n uh, objects, uh, and suppose it has m cycles, then there's this formula, which I've never actually found the name for. I mean, I'm, I know Cauchy knew it, I'm sure, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe Euclid did, but at least if someone in the room, you know, can tell me later or real time, you're looking it up in Google, uh, I, I don't know exactly where uh, I saw this, but in any event, it's a theorem. So let's just see what it says. It says that the number of cycles e is equal to uh, mod 2, the number of inversions which you have to compute, and the number of points. Now, the number of points, it turns out, I'll even tell you. It's not going to help you. Um, or you can put that in your, I'm going to have to do some counting. So. Counting the number of points is the easiest part. Counting the number of inversions is the harder part. All right? So, and if you want to know why this is a formula, if you doubt me, you know, I don't know if I really, it's really quite simple. But here's at least a proof the way I th think about it. I just relabel the cycles since it's not hard to show that the way you label things doesn't change anything. And if you label them one, two, three, and then repeat, uh, you, you get the total number of inversions is this simple formula. And since it's th that, um, you get pi, inversion of pi, and the number of these is m, 
and the number of things you're taking off is n. And of course, the minus goes away because it's mod 2, the power of working mod 2. Anyway, so it's not a hard theorem to, to prove. So, so how do we actually, oh, I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, so, so I'm going to come back to that. But for the moment, what you can think is, suppose we're back with this extremely long line. Suppose we had some counting. You know, maybe we have sharp p. We're only applying it to a very little representation. So you can start to see we would get some complexity theory consequences, right? I mean, possibly. The trouble is this problem on two um, lines, which I think, if you haven't figured out prior to this, or you hadn't seen a proof of this, maybe there are other proofs, um, you might be a little surprised that you could do this by just counting simple things like inversions. I mean, at least I thought that's sort of what hooked me in, and I spent more hours than I care to admit thinking about this because it just seemed kind of, to me, a little magical that you could do this for two cycles. It just, it's, you know, that you could tell two from one, or that you could get the parity one, two. Now, here's the, here's the problem. The problem is, is something I'll call the three-line problem, which, you know, you can already guess. I don't have to write it all out. But the three-line problem now has three starts and three terminals, and you have to find, you know, who you really connect to. And, of course, there are... Uh, what, six different ways, you know, all, all factorial can occur. Uh, so you could try the same thing, and obviously, you're, you know, the one, one possibility is you get, uh, maybe you cross connect these and get this, that would be two cycles, or you, get, you guess correctly, that would be three cycles. Well, you can tell two from three, because everything we said would work no matter how many cycles you had. So if you could somehow reduce it to telling two from three, you would, you would actually be good. And the reason it's really good is this turns out to be uh, good enough to encode log space. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, you know, I'm sorry, encode uh, counting, you know, encode, encode a complexity class high enough up that we'd be interested. So, so this is, it, you, you can do that. And three is somehow, you know, again, sometimes things are special. <laughs> it's just two doesn't work. Uh, and sometimes I've proved that, right? Because if you could really show how to map fairly general computations into telling a two-cycle problem, since I've solved that, we'd already be done and we could celebrate after this, which I guess we're going to do anyway, because it's, the day's over, <laughs> not because of anything you know, I'm saying. But you see, so three is really important. So how do you go? All right, this is kind of where I got stuck. And um, I did a whole bunch of things. So let me tell you a couple of things. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much longer. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying we can, yeah. so we can solve the two-line problem. You can even you don't even need sharp p on, on small objects. You can even do it all in polynomial time, provided the circuit that decides successor and uh, predecessor is easy. And I want to explain what that is in a sec. That's not a good definition. I think it's actually equivalent to something that you know, we know, but I didn't want to use that for some reasons. But uh, three lines don't yield to parity. One versus three. What's going to happen is you're going to guess, and you're going to get one versus three, and you're just stuck. All right? I mean, it's, it's just the way at least I'm stuck. OK. So here, here's, here's a very simple way to define. Think of this as the successor or the predecessor uh, relationship that, that encodes the graph on strings of, say, make they're all exactly left n. And what we're going to do is we're going to say there's a finite automata that if it's given the two strings stacked above each other, you, you can build a finite automata that checks that x, x is followed by y. So that's a very simple kind of circuit, right? Everybody understand? I mean, is there a standard name for stacking things as well? I mean, it's a good trick that we've used all the time. Do you, you've seen this before, no doubt, most of us. Um, I, I can't resist since I think I have a few minutes. Uh, this trick of stacking uh, this way, you can, you can the following, if you teach finite atomic theory or if, or if you don't know the following theorem, it's a cute one. It's actually in Mike Sipter's uh, book. Um, and, and I'm absolutely sure you know, what do they say? I've taught that person everything they know. Uh, with Mike, I can say, I taught him, I taught him one thing I know. 
because he once took finite automata theory from me, and I taught him this trick. So anyway, um, the trick is that you can prove things like Pressburger arithmetic, which is the first order theory, if you don't recall, first order theory of, of addition. It, it's a classic theorem that it's decidable, and it's not actually terribly badly decidable. But using finite automata theory, you can, and using the stacking trick, you can prove decidability. Unfortunately, you get a terrible bound, but it's still decidable. And, and the reason that works there is that you can think of this, the automata is going to check, actually say three, an x and a y and a z, and, and check that x plus y equals z. And notice the automata just has to keep carries. So it actually has a very small state. Is everybody following the idea? And I'm using the same thing. So I'm saying that you can even assume, even though those three lines are coding a Turing machine computation, which could be pretty complicated, it's a very local computation, so you can code it this way. All right. So here's what we can prove. If, if this three-line problem was doable in this case with the, the actual graph is described in this very simple way, then, then we would get... Uh, you know, we would solve Eurus's question. I mean, of course, it's not really due to Eurus, but we would show that his, his slide can now be erased if he still has it, and we could get a nice not equal. We're not contained. Uh, I don't know how to do that. So let me end. I guess I have to have at least five minutes or something like that. Is that about right? Can I just, where is our? We've got plenty of time. Oh, plenty of time. Too fast. OK. All right. I'll tell you more stories. Anyway. I will tell you how I tried to attack this. Um, and I spent a lot of time on this, and I think it's interesting. I just have really two slides. So, well, let me even, before I even put it up. So, if, if, we, can, if we can count mod two, often we can count mod four, right? There are lots of theorems like that, right? I mean, they're not, they're not always the case. It depends on the objects. But very often we can do that. Counting mod a different prime is another business. So if we could count mod three, we'd be home free. And it, just more generally, mathematically, if you think about it, what we're really doing is using the fact that the simple, I'm sorry, the symmetric group uh, has one non-trivial uh, isomorph, um, I'm sorry, homomorphism, the, uh, you know, the uh, parity of the permutation. Right? I mean, remember, SN is not simple. Uh, the alternating group is. And so you go down one. So basically, we're using that fact. We're using the fact that we can compute some character over the symmetric group really easily. So if you could figure out ways to compute some other character, you could also solve this problem. So another way to look at this, if you believe that log space less than uh, sharp P is not going to be solved, not that that's, that's false, but not that I'm going to solve it or you're going to solve it, one thing you're obligated to do is show you can't find another character that's, that's computable in the same kind of local way. Does, does, does that make sense to you all? I mean, you see how if you could do it, just say mod 3, if you could compute mod 3, you would be home free, right? I mean, maybe that's, you know, if you, if you wanted to know, just play the cases. So sort of trust me on that. But if you compute mod 4, you could do it also. So here's an old trick. You probably all know this, but I'll just, since I have time, I'll go over it. Um, suppose you have a class of sets you can compute their cardinality mod 2. So suppose you want to count the uh, cardinality of that set mod 4. So does everybody know the trick? So the standard trick, at least I, I always knew, was you, you create a new set which consists of unordered pairs of distinct elements from the set. All right? And of course it's m choose 2 or if you like m times m minus 1 over 2. So you've gone from M to a much bigger, but that's okay. And what you basically do is now count this mod 2. And you know, so if you know M, what I'm really saying, if you know M mod 2 and you know M choose 2 mod 2, you can figure out M mod 4. Just simple exercise. And that's how you can sort of ample, that's another amplifier. I guess today is all amplifiers for me. But that's like an amplifier, right? You're taking... The, uh, the number, building all the pairs, getting more information just out of the mod 2 oracle you've got. So, you know, the first thing I thought about was, well, let me just do this in an obvious way for cycles or for permutations. And the trouble I ran into is I found an idea, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. 
exactly, but it seems interesting. Uh, it has a lot of unusual properties. And given the time, even with the extra time, I'm not going to tell you. But I tried to do something like this. So what I needed was a, a way to take a, a graph that represented uh, you know, cycles and somehow build its unordered pair structure. So, I mean, you know, here's, here's an obvious idea. You take the graph and say, assume the graph just consists of directed cycles. Let the vertices just be the unordered pairs. And say there's an edge from x, y if x's successor is x prime and y's successor is y prime. Right? Does that seem, you know, sort of plausible? I mean, and I've looked around. I'm not saying this is, I mean, I think it even says new graph power. Um, you, you, can do, you can generalize this to a graph product, you know, because there's no reason the graph has to be the same. Um, I have some evidence because some people, I think I posted this on the blog a couple of years ago now, and uh, got some people sending me papers working on this new product or something. So um, I have, I think there's a, a book, I forget the exact title, but it's like Graph Powers or Graph Products that's, you know, 400 pages of every possible direct product, Lex product, what are some of the other ones? I forget all the uh, different products of graphs. They're almost all. Um, replace this by uh, ordered pairs. And the trouble with ordered pairs is, is, well, that's why we picked unordered pairs. You needed the m choose 2. If you went to m squared, you'd be, you just, it just doesn't work. So you really need the unordered structure. So when I speed strange properties, I, I, I should have maybe uh, prepared a slide, but when you take a graph and say even just square it or raise it or cube it, um, you, what happens is it's not obvious what the cycle structure is. I mean, I've, you know, I worked on it and have a whole bunch of lemmas of how that works for small powers. But I don't know, I guess just to end, what I mean is, I guess I can put this down. So what I'm saying is if you take this graph, I don't, you know, we need a new symbol, but, you know, I don't know. Say that. This one is squaring. I, I was trying to say you could even imagine a, you know, taking two graphs. But what happens if you take a directed cycle, um, the nasty thing that happens is when you, when you do this, what you'd really like is if you start out with a graph with, with you know, um, uh, M or, say, K cycles, you'd like to go to K choose two. Then you'd be done. Or something like that. It doesn't have to be exactly K choose two. But some reasonable function that lets you get squeeze information. But what happens is you get uh, shortcuts. You get graphs. When you take a cycle, sometimes when you just say square, you may find that you don't just get um, uh, several fours. You get some twos because there are short ways to go. And somehow that doesn't happen when you just take objects and make them unordered pairs. You did that with the vertices, but now the edges, um, you know, so what would happen, almost done. What would happen is if you had a path that was going like this, you know, for say some length, you, you might have it that if you skip every other one, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a graph. So what's gonna happen is the structure of the power, just say raised to two, is not, it's, it's not very simple. Am I, am I clear? Yeah, I'm just about done. So what, I don't mean that this won't work, and I did spend some time trying to prove and understand some of the least low degree powers of graphs under this operation. This operation may have other applications, and that would be cool. And like I said, I have, you know, studied it with trying to prove some things. But there are a whole bunch of conjectures in the real sense of conjectures that I couldn't prove that I didn't really understand how this, this product really worked in general. I mean, it, of course I do, but you know, in the same way we, we hear sometimes about dichotomy, you, know, you really would like to have a closed form or something very simple describing what is G to the, you know, two to the K or something. What does that really look like in terms of cycle structure? And it's not, it's not at least to me, it doesn't seem very simple. So uh, I'd like to stop there and uh, thank you again and any questions.
So any, any of you, so I have a question. So any, any of you are going to work on the four-color theorem? <laughs> At least think about this. Okay, not, not going to happen. All right. Um, Oh, <laughs> no, no, I challenge you. This, this uh, separation problem. Yeah. I mean, is there any hope? Well, I, I do, th yeah, I mean, if I, you know, I, I, I fell on a fair amount of time on it. Uh, I think it at least avoids the known obstacles like nat natural proofs and, and oracles because it's looking, it's ripping things apart and, you know, it's, it's using theorems that don't relativize. So. And, and don't seem to hit the other stuff. Uh, I, I, I thought I was, you know, I mean, we get a lot of, well, I don't like to use the word, I use the word amateur or uh, wrong or something, but we get, you know, because of visibility, we have enough luck, we get a lot of people claiming, you know, P equals NVP, not equal NVP. I was like, well, why don't you shoot for something simpler, like we don't even know if SAT can't be done in linear time, you know, give, give me a proof that you could, Prove you know it's, it takes at least super linear time to do SAT. I would be very excited. Uh, so I think there's some hope here. I did put a lot of time. I, I do like this. I mean, it seems like I can I can really reduce this. You know, if you wanted to talk offline, to some very simple questions about this operator or maybe some other operators. Anyway, so then my answer is yeah. I'll probably still think about it, but I'm kind of off it for a while right now. I think we had oh, food food is too important. Okay. Food, I mean, I, I can't stop you from eating. Thanks again for inviting me.